Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, good morning, Rescue Church. How's everyone doing this morning? I want to say welcome to all of our locations. Great to have you with us today. To those of you gathered in Flandreau, good morning. Great to see you. To our Coleman campus, what's up, guys over there? Great to see all of you. Hello, Garrett's in South Dakota. Great to have you guys with us this morning. To our campus all the way down in Deeside, Jamaica. Can I just say we are so glad to have you guys as part of the Rescue Church, but can I tell you something? We don't really care how hot you are right now in D-side Jamaica because we're freezing up here in South Dakota. It's making me wear this ugly little sweater vest. That's how cold it is up here. It's been a really cold week. So uh, we're glad you're in the warm sunshine trying to be happy for you. But we're glad to have you with us this week. I also want to say hello to our Peoria Deaf Campus. We love you guys. Great to have you with us this morning. Also, also we want to say to a very special group, good morning to the Coffee Shop campus in Slayton, Minnesota. Technically, they're not a full-blown campus yet, but we've got a group starting to meet there in a coffee shop in Slayton, so great to have you guys with us. Man, this is getting exhausting. Welcome, everybody, to all of you on our iCampus. We're glad to have you, so it's just great to have you with us this morning. Wherever you're joining us from, thank you for being here. Um, I want to start by pointing something out to you. By now, in all of our locations, you should have received the uh, elements for the Lord's Supper for communion, the, the grape juice and the little cracker that should have been passed out by this point. Um, this Here's the deal. Some of you might be noticing and looking around going, we don't have notes. Normally John has handouts and a note that for me to write on and all that. I don't have that this week on purpose. Uh, sometimes my preaching style, I kind of like to provide a handout and you can follow along with me and all of that. And that's a good thing. But there are times where on purpose I just intentionally decide I'm not doing a handout this week. And this is one of those weeks because today... I want you to connect with this message more from your heart, if I can say that, rather than just intellectually in your head. And so what you have in your hands ought to be the elements for the Lord's Supper, which we're going to observe at the end of my message, this little powerful symbolic representation of the body of Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing really mystical about those elements or super special about it other than I believe Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he gave us this powerful symbolism of the crucifixion to remind us of the the amazing price that Jesus paid on our behalf. And so you've got that in your hands and uh, just hang on to that while I talk to you for the next few minutes because uh, I want that just to be a visual reminder of the great price that has been paid on your behalf and my behalf. If I can start today by just making a confession, can I tell you something? Um, This message that I'm getting ready to share with you today is one that is fresh in my mind that God had to deal with me this week, very fresh, because if I can just be honest and confess something, this past week, earlier in the week, I just had this, and I hope I'm not being too vulnerable and too honest when I say this, but it's real and I'm just going to share it with you. Like I had this wave of discouragement just wash over me this week. And it happens from time to time, and there wasn't anything necessarily that was even wrong per se. I mean, maybe some little things here and there, but from time to time, I just experience the, these dark waves of discouragement that wash over me, and, and I just sit there in funky town. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever taken a trip to funky town where you're just kind of down in a funk, in the junk, and you don't know why, but you're just like, I don't feel very good right now. I just feel discouraged. And for me personally, at least this week, here, here's what it looked like. And I hope, again, I hope I'm not being too vulnerable and y'all are going to think I'm crazy, but I'm just letting you in on this is what a day in the life of your pastor looks like sometimes. So I'm just experiencing like these voices, not audible voices. I'm not hearing things like that. But, but these just little messages, these little thoughts that pop into my brain that I've struggled with. And there's these little accusing voices that are kind of like this, like I'm just hearing this stuff that says, I suck as a pastor. I do. Like, I, you're not doing a very good job leading this church. You're not. And probably everyone's going to leave you in a matter of a week or two, and the whole thing's going to fail, and you're really a failure in what you're doing. Your, your life isn't that successful. Things aren't really going very well for you, to be honest. Now, again, 
I'm not saying I really believe that or think any of that's true, but these are the thoughts that are hitting me, and I'm just in this cloud of discouragement and dealing with this. And yet, imagine this, the irony in all of this. Here I am, Pastor John, sitting down, working on preaching a message, right? I'm working on a message as part of our Fear Less series. Does anyone else see the irony in this? And yet, as I'm preparing this message, I'm dealing with this stuff. And here's what I want you to know. like God brought me face-to-face this week for myself with the text that I'm getting ready to share with you with a question that I had to answer again this week in my life. And I'm titling this message this weekend, A question you must answer because we're going to see today in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is going to bring us face to face with the same question. And I would contend it is the most important question in Romans chapter 8. We've been, just to bring you up to speed, if this is one of your first weeks with us here in the Rescue Church, the last few weeks we've been in a series called Fear Less. And we're, we're basically, here's kind of the big idea of the series, I'm just making the point that I believe we live in a time right now in human history where there's some really dark stuff going on in our world. There, there's some really scary things, some bad things happening in our world. And what I sense is that a lot of people in our society today are responding to all of the negative headlines and the scary news stories and, and the very real threats that we see happening in our world. We're responding with a lot of fear. And people are very unsettled right now. And people don't have a very positive outlook on the future. And and so I believe that God wants to just speak a message right now over his people. Starting with our church and anyone else listening to this. That God is saying to us right now, this is a time to fear less. It is possible for you to go through life fearlessly. Because of who I am, because of who your God is, not because of of the circumstances that surround you. Okay, so that's kind of the big idea of the series we're in. We've been in Romans chapter 8, and if you've got your Bibles and want to flip open to Romans chapter 8 with me, that's where we're going to be today. We're going to continue through this absolutely transformational passage of Scripture. And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul has to say in Romans chapter 8. Check this out. We're going to pick up in uh, verse 31. He, he begins to ask the question like this. Watch this. He says, What then shall we say in response to these things? And, and I'm going to pause right here before I go any further, and I want to just ask the question, what are the these things the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says, what should we say in response to these things? Well, it's possible that he's referring to all of the things he's written in the letter of Romans up to this point, all of the stuff that he's unpacked, the doctrine of the Christian faith. He could be referring to all of it. But for the sake of time, let me just look at some of the highlights in, in Romans chapter 8, just the things that we've drawn out of Romans 8 so far in this fearless series. Okay, so maybe when the Apostle Paul says, in how should we respond to all of these things, maybe he's referring to Romans 8 verse 1. We looked at it the very first week of the series where God's word says to us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe he's referring to the fact that God has said over your life and over my life, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, if we have accepted his forgiveness of all of our sin by believing in him and calling upon his name, that right now, as we speak, in this moment, there is no condemnation over your life. God does not condemn you for the sin in your life. Maybe he's referring to that. It's possible. He could be referring to where he said that the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Maybe he's referring to the fact that for those of us who are in Christ, right now today, we have been set free. We are not in bondage anymore to the law of sin and death. Maybe he's talking about that. Maybe he's talking about the part where we looked at where he says that you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Remember where he said that? But instead, you received the spirit of adoption. Remember, we've talked about the fact that for those of us who put our faith in Christ, we are in God's family. We have been called children of the Most High God. And maybe that's what the the Apostle Paul is referring to when he says, what should we say in response to all of these things? Maybe he's referring to that part where we read last week where the Apostle Paul wrote that 
all of the suffering that this present suffering we're going through doesn't even begin to compare to the glory of eternity that's coming our way. And, and like last week, we talked about the reality that, yes, we live in a world where bad things happen to good people, but, but Paul is saying, listen, these present sufferings that you're enduring, they don't even begin to compare to the glory that's coming. Maybe he's referring to Romans 8, 28 that we talked about last week, this promise of God for those who love God and have been called according to his purpose, this promise where the Almighty God says, I will make sure that all things that happen to you in your life will be worked together for your good. I'm not saying everything you go through is good, but I promise I will bring good out of it and I will accomplish my eternal purposes in your life, even through your pain, even in spite of your pain. Maybe he's talking about all of that, but he says, how then should we respond to these things? Watch what he goes on to say. Here's the question that I had to wrestle with this week, and it's the question that I believe God wants to ask you right now. The Apostle Paul, in the second half of Romans 8.31, he says, If God is for us, who can be against us? I like that he makes this a question and not just a statement. Do you realize he didn't just say, God is for you, he asks it in a question. He frames it from the standpoint of if. If God is for us, keep in mind all of those things we just talked about, if that stuff is true, if God is really for us, who can stand against us? And I want to contend that that's the question you have to wrestle with is the question of if. If God is for us, is God really for you? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is really for you? The Bible says that he is in so many different ways. But do you believe it? I, I want to share this quote with you. And this is kind of a cool side story. Can I, can I share a story real quick? You want to hear a story? Um, when we were preparing this series, this is these cool little God stories that I, I love this stuff. We were preparing this series about fear less, and we're talking about these conversations with our campus pastors, and it was actually Pastor Tyler from our Garrettson campus who recommended a passage in Romans 8. He was the one who kind of got me focused on Romans 8, right? So I'm sitting here looking at some of these verses, and I'm like, okay, this is good stuff, right? Well, back up a little bit. A few weeks prior... Um, one day I, I came into my office and there was a book sitting on my desk, right? And uh, we have a secretary who does awesome stuff. She likes getting good deals wherever she can. And she gets all these free books and a lot of them end up on my desk. She keeps the good ones for herself, I think. But she gives me some of the leftovers. And here's this book from one of my favorite authors by the name of Mark Batterson. You've probably heard me mention him a time or two. And the book is simply called If. And I didn't even know what it was about. But as we were preparing this series, at one point I just felt like pick up that book and see what's in there. And I started thumbing through the book, and guess what the book If is all about? It's about Romans chapter 8. And so here I am getting ready to preach a series on Romans chapter 8, and here's this book that is titled If, and it's all about Romans chapter 8. And, and Mark Batterson has this to say about Romans 8.31. Listen to this quote. He says, You've got to settle the issue. If you have subconscious doubts about God's good intentions, they'll manifest in a thousand forms, are you ready for this, of fear. What, what Mark is saying there is this, that you have to settle this question in your mind. Is God really for you? Because if deep down you have these underlying beliefs that God really isn't for you, it's going to show up in all kinds of forms of fear in your life. And I want to contend that the most insidious lie you could believe about God is that somehow he is against you. Because if you believe that lie, what I want you to know is that it will be the foundation, it will be the underlying cause of so many false things that you then believe that show up in your life as fearful thoughts. And this is what God brought me face to face with this week as I'm sitting there wrestling with these accusing thoughts of you suck as a pastor. You're not very good at what you're doing here. This whole thing's going to fail. When people really find out how much you don't know what you're doing, they're all going to leave. Like As I'm sitting there wrestling with all of this, God just faithfully 
convicted me and brought me to this question, John, do you really believe that I'm for you? You're getting ready to go tell a bunch of people on Sunday that I am, but do you believe it? Do you believe that I'm really for you? And that's the question that God is asking you today. If, if I'm really for you, then who can be against you? Do you believe it? Have you settled that issue in your mind? So I'm just telling you, like, here I am, standing here on the stage saying, you need to settle this issue. Do you believe God's for you? But can I just be honest? Let's be honest for a minute. Because sometimes our heads want to say, I know I should believe that intellectually. See, there's a reason you're not taking notes today. I don't want you to think of this as an intellectual exercise. Our hearts have to get this. Because you might be thinking to yourself, I know what the Bible says. I know what the textbook answer is that I'm supposed to say, yes, I believe God is for me. But here's the thing, Pastor John, that you might not understand. It's hard for me to trust God because I have trusted other people in my life who were supposed to be safe, who I should have been able to trust, and they betrayed me, and they hurt me. And now I have a hard time trusting God because, by the way, where was he in all of that? See, here's the thing, John. I want to believe that God is for me, but what you may not understand is that I've been praying for healing in my physical body or in the body of someone else that I love deeply, and it doesn't really seem like God is hearing or answering those prayers, and I'm struggling right now today to really believe that God is for me. And here's the thing, John. Like I've got this financial stuff going on in my life, and I've been lifting it up to the Lord, and, and I just don't know that he knows about my need or that he really cares, and I know intellectually I'm supposed to believe God is for me, but right now my heart's having a hard time catching up to that and believing that God is really for me. How can I know that God is for me? How can I really know? And see, this is why right now in all of our locations, I want you to be holding on to these simple elements of the Lord's Supper. Because I believe that these visually and powerfully represent a demonstration of the answer to that question, how can we know that God is really for us? Because watch this, as we keep reading. Next verse, Romans 8, 32, listen to what Paul goes on to say. He says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Do you know what Paul is saying there is this? He's basically saying that you want to know how you can know that God is for you because this is the God who did not spare the most precious thing that he had, the life of his one and only begotten son. He did not spare him. He willingly gave him up for us for sinful mankind who was not deserving of the gift of eternal life that Jesus came to buy on our behalf. We weren't deserving of it, and yet God gave it up for us. You know a thought that God brought to me this past week as I was preparing this? Um, like, what am I willing to give up for the Lord and for other people? And, and I'm just here to tell you, there are many things in my life that I think I would give up. I would give up carrots pretty easily for the Lord and for other people. Um, I would give up exercise pretty easy. No, but I mean, seriously, even more things that are more important to me. Like, there are things that I think I would be willing to give up, or, or if someone were even to, like, at, at put a gun to my head and say, I'm taking this from you if you're not going to fight for it. There's a lot of things I'd be like, hey, you can have it. You can have it. But parents, can, can we just be honest about something? For those of you who have children, can we talk about the heart of a parent toward their child for just a moment. And if, you've, if you're a parent, you know what this is about. Like, you can go from not even knowing this little human being that maybe, maybe you didn't even plan on having this little human being, right? Don't raise your hand if you're one of those. I will, but you don't have to. But, but you, you might not have even planned on this little human being, and you don't even know this little, this little person that gets born into the world, and in a matter of moments, something happens in your heart where you just are ready to die for that child. You would give your life. You've experienced the love on a deeper level than anything you've ever experienced before to where I, you can take a lot of things from me, but if you come after my kids, I will lay down my life for my children. You're not getting them. And it was that heart of a perfect father who was willing to give up his son 
and watch his one and only son endure an unbelievable torment on the cross of Calvary in order to buy us back into a right relationship with him, what I want you to know is that the cross of Calvary points to just how much God is for us. I've heard it said this way, that how much does God love us? He loves us this much with outstretched arms that are impaled to the old rugged cross where Jesus laid down his life, where his body was broken and his blood was shed to buy us back into a right relationship with himself. Paul says that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how much more will he not graciously give us all things? And so I asked the question, you know, we're in this series of fear less, and we're talking about all this stuff that there is to fear in the world and all of the bad negative headlines, and I just want to ask this question. If God is for us so much to the point that he was willing to give up his son on our behalf, do you not think that he is not only able, but then willing to also provide for his children even when the economy's not doing very well? That we don't have to buy into that fear that we're just not going to make it. The economy's going south. What if you actually believe that God is for you and he's over all of this and he's going to take care of you? Do you not believe that if God is for you to the point that he's willing to give up his son on your behalf, that he's not willing and able to provide physical healing in your body or in the body of that person you love so much that he can do it? that he's willing to do it, that he's for you? Do you not believe that he's willing and able to smash the chains of addiction that have held you in bondage for so long because he's for you? He gave up his son. He can do that too. Do you not believe that he is willing and able to step into your life in so many other powerful ways and bring healing into your emotional past, the scars and the wounds and those deep places that you've been hurt? Don't you think he's for you enough that he can meet you in that pain? That he can walk with you through this trial right now? Even though you might feel at times that he seems very distant and you don't know where he is in all of this, do you really believe that he's for you? I would contend that the cross of Calvary demonstrates just how much God is truly for us. If God is for us, Who can be against us? Let's keep going here. Look at this next verse. This is so cool. We've got two more verses I want to share, and then I'll get out of the way. Verse 33 says this. Paul goes on to say, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? And I love the fact he says that those who God has chosen, you've been chosen by him if you're in his family. He says, It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Can I answer his question? I'll tell you who is the one who does not condemn. And his name is Jesus, who does not condemn. Remember Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So who is it? According to Paul, he asks the question, Who is it who condemns? We know who it is. It's the enemy of our soul. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And at the heart of his mission is to get us going all the way back to Genesis 3, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. His ultimate M.O. is to get us to doubt God's good intentions toward us. And he does it by accusing thoughts, accusing us. And a lot of times, can I just say this, like sometimes the voice of the enemy sounds an awful lot like my own voice. In things that I say to myself, thoughts that I didn't really think, but thoughts that were kind of thrown out there for me just to buy into and, and say over my own life, and, and he accuses me. You're not a very good father. You're not a very good pastor. You're not a very good leader. You're not a very good friend. You're not a good mom. You're not a good Christian. You're not, and he, he accuses us, and he accuses God. God isn't really for you. You're probably more alone than you realize in this world. People, they really don't like you. And Paul says, who is it who accuses? It's not Jesus. Church, what I want you to know is this, that when you hear those voices, when you sense those messages coming into your, firing across your your brain, what you need to understand is that is not 
the Holy Spirit of God speaking. That is not your Father who loves you and who is for you. That's the accuser of the brethren. Because watch this. Paul goes on to say this, verse 34. I love this. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also, what is he doing for us, church? He is also interceding for us. What an amazing truth. Last week we learned that the Holy Spirit, part of his role is that he prays for us. That that he's able to put our groans into words like things we can't even begin to articulate. The Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. And now Paul tells us that not only is the Holy Spirit interceding for us, Jesus Christ himself, seated at the right hand of God the Father, is speaking on our behalf and interceding. We have two of the three members of the Godhead praying for us because we serve a God who is for us. We serve a God who cares deeply about us to me that's just an amazing thought and here's what i want you to know that um, today as we enter into the lord's supper the lord's table communion whatever you call it um, in just a few minutes i'm going to invite your campus pastors to come and uh, lead you into this time of worship and and remembrance but i want to set the stage by calling us to remember that we serve a god who is for us And before I close in a word of prayer, can I just ask this in all of our locations? Can I ask uh, for everyone to to bow your head and close your eyes? Wherever you're at, on our iCanvas, I don't care. Wherever you're at, whatever location, bow your heads, close your eyes. No one looking around. The the Lord's Supper is supposed to be a time of reflection anyway, and it's about you and your relationship with God and not anything else. And so I want to ask this question today before we go any further. We're, We're about to celebrate and remember and say thank you to the Lord Jesus for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf when his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. I want to ask the question today, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed right now in this quiet moment, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as as your personal Savior? Have you believed in him? Have you called upon his name? Have you asked him to be the Lord of your life? Have you received the forgiveness of your sin. That's what we're getting ready to celebrate is the high price that he paid in order for us to be free and to, and, and to be forgiven. Do you know him personally for yourself? I'm not asking, did you grow up in church? I'm not asking, were your parents religious? I'm not asking if your grandma was saved. I'm asking, do you know Jesus Christ personally on a personal level for yourself? If not, in the next few moments of silence, I would encourage you right now from where you're sitting that you just call on the name of Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I, I don't understand fully maybe all that it means to be a follower of you, but I know that I need you. And today I'm inviting you to be the Lord of my life. I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life and to save me from my sin. I accept your gift of forgiveness. And as I proceed with the Lord's Supper, I want to just truly touch the, the real meaning of what this is about, that you gave your life for me because you are for me and I would contend you need Jesus more than anything else today do you know him for those of you that are sitting with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you would honestly say yeah John I do know the Lord I can say that with a clear conscience Jesus lives inside of me I know I'm one of God's children I've accepted that by faith can I just ask you have you settled the question of if for yourself do you believe in your heart that God is truly for you Have you settled that issue? If not, if subconsciously, deep down, you still are wrestling with these lies that say God might actually be against me. Like Mark said, it'll manifest itself in all forms of fear in your life. But I want you, as we get ready to proceed with the Lord's Supper, I want you to look at those elements in your hands and remember that we serve a God who was willing to not spare his own son for us, but he freely gave him up. And a real life was lost for our sin. His body was broken. His blood was shed because God is for us. He absolutely loves you today, and he is for you. And he wants his perfect will to be accomplished in your life. And I'm asking you, I'm challenging you to believe him for that as we close in a word of prayer today. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given to us. And I thank you for what it is we celebrate on a day like today as we look back to the cross and we remember the amazing price that Jesus paid on our behalf, that his body was broken and his blood was poured out so that we could be made right with you, so that we could be forgiven of our sin, 
Father, I thank you for the powerful demonstration. I, I can't think of any other way that you can show us just how much you are for us because you gave up your one and only son on our behalf. And we're gathered today as a church, Lord, as a grateful people to say thank you to you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in the sound of my voice in any of our locations who does not know you as, as their Lord and Savior, that right now they would be calling on the name of Jesus for, for salvation. That they would be accepting your free gift of eternal life by putting their faith and trust in you and believing in your name. Lord, I believe that I'm speaking to people who are wrestling with the same junk I wrestled with just a few days ago. And it doesn't matter how long we followed you, Lord, it's just... Every once in a while, we, we hear these accusing voices that say, you're not really with us. Father, help us to combat those lies for what they are and to expose them for the lies that they are and to believe deep in our heart that you truly are for us. And if you are for us, who can be against us? The answer is no one, nothing, as we're going to see even more next week. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for your blood that was poured out on our behalf, and I pray that you would just be with us now in the following moments of worship as we say thank you to you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We love you. It's in your precious and powerful and holy name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from The Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com. If you'd like to share how God spoke to you through this message, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your stories to the rescue church at hotmail.com. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry of the Rescue Church by giving online at our website under the Donate tab.